परात्मानमेक जगद्बीजमाध्यम निरीह निराकार वेद्यम यो जायते पाल्यते ये न विश्व तमीशं भजे लीयते यत्र विश्व हरिओं तत्स हरिओं तत्स हरिओं तत्स Dear students, <clears throat> I am very delighted to be participating in this uh, Gita Mahotsav organized by IIT Kanpur, for which I heartily thank the organizers for having according this invitation to me, and uh, it is a great. pleasure and a great joy to delve on this very important subject of bhagavad gita and the subject of karma yoga in the bhagavad gita and as far as the importance of bhagavad gita is concerned i personally i consider this is to this is this book to be the greatest work which deals with the philosophy of life it gives us a comprehensive philosophy of life and in this respect perhaps no other book can match the grandeur the majesty the profundity and the clarity with which bhagwan shri krishna presents this wonderful picture of the complete comprehensive philosophy of life <clears throat> so before we get into the subject of karma yoga let us just try to understand what exactly bhagavad gita deals with it's fine it is the comprehensive philosophy of life but if you look at the book it seems to be a massive book with more more than 700 verses in it but if you study it carefully the subject is very simple you can categorize the entire book into two parts one part of the book deals with the true nature of man the true nature nature of this world which we are experiencing and the other part of the book deals with the way to experience the true nature of man the way to experience the true nature of this entire creation which we are experiencing so one is the goal and other is the means to reach that goal so one is the end other is the upaya Shankaracharya says, "It is the upaya, prapti upaya, tat prapti upaya, to reach this true dimension, the eternal dimension, the unchanging dimension of this human personality." So, in this way, we can see that Bhagavad Gita deals with this issue of taking us from the realm which we are presently experiencing to the realm which is actually true. and without experiencing that human life can never be fulfilled so this is what broadly speaking bhagwan shri krishna accomplishes in this wonderful book called bhagavad gita in which through the instrumentality of arjun shri krishna is showing the way for the entire humanity to raise themselves from the level at which they are living to the level of that absolute reality and among the different ways which are discussed there karma is one of the way karma yoga is one of the way there are other parts also which have been discussed which when practiced takes us to that ultimate reality so among the different parts discussed in the bhagavad gita 
karma yoga is one such very important part. <clears throat> now, before understanding what this karma yoga is, let us try to understand one point. This karma yoga, actually speaking, cannot be discussed without referring to the true nature of man. It is only in the context of the true nature of the human being that this karma yoga becomes relevant and it comes into existence. Because karma yoga essentially means to, it is a means to reach that true nature of man. So, when we talk, talk about the human being, this human system, we have two dimensions. One is the real dimension, which is actually existing, and other is the apparent dimension. We can say that one is the real man, <clears throat> the other is the apparent man, or the fictional identity that we have. One is the real identity, and the other is the fictional identity which all of us have. Now, in our day-to-day -day life, all of our actions can either be based on the real nature of man, and the actions can be performed for the sake of the real dimension and the real nature of man, or our actions can be based upon the fictional identity or the apparent man, and the actions may be performed for the sake of the fictional person or the apparent man. In this way, the karma, the actions which we perform in our everyday life, they can be either binding or liberating, depending upon the kind of basis that we choose. Now see, when actions are performed based on the fictional identity of the human being, and for the sake of the fictional man or the apparent man, that is karma. It binds us. Opposed to this, when we perform actions based on the real nature of man, and for the sake of the real nature of the man, then that action becomes karma yoga, and it liberates us. Now, a little bit about this real nature of man and the apparent nature of man, because this may be a little bit confusing for some of us. When I talk about the real nature of man, we need to understand that. What we understand ourselves to be in our present state, we know ourselves to be only this body and mind, and our identity is completely based upon this body and mind idea. This is what Vedanta refers to as the apparent man or the fictional man because when we inquire into the truth of this fictional identity, I call it fictional because it goes away. When we inquire into the true nature of our own self, who am I, slowly the truth dawns and the true nature of man which is referred to by the great masters as the Atman, that begins to reveal its true nature. It begins to be experienced by the spiritual seeker. So the true nature of man, which is referred to as Atman, is behind this body and the mind which we are experiencing. And our identity as Mr. So-and-so or Miss So-and-so based upon the body and the mind, is a provisional identity, or we can say it's a fictional identity, which is not true, which is not absolutely true. This will go away. When we initiate the process of inquiry into who I am, we will slowly move towards the experience of our real identity, which is beyond the body and the mind, which is referred to as the Atman, which is unchanging which is undying. In fact, all the best things of life comes from that dimension. 
let all the students remember this one important point. The best things of life comes from the non-physical dimension of the human personality. Please note it down. All the best things of life which we are looking for, no matter whether we are students, professionals, or anybody else, it comes from the non-physical dimension and never from the physical dimension of human personality. Because this physical dimension of this human being, as well as the world which we are experiencing, it is constantly changing. It is transient. It is impermanent. It is continuously getting destroyed. So this one understanding we should have, it is only in this context that Karma Yoga comes into existence. So Karma Yoga is the means that we have through which the human being in and through the field arena of action, he moves towards the true nature of his own being from the fictional identity. This is what is the main purpose of Karma Yoga. Let us make this point very clear. So this is what I said. When actions are performed based upon our fictional identity and for the sake of the fictional identity, then that is karma which binds us, which keeps us bound to this fictional realm, this transient realm, the temporary realm, and it makes us suffer in different ways. And at the same time, when actions are performed with the intention of experiencing the true nature of the man, and for the sake of the true nature of the man, which is Atman, then that very action becomes karma yoga, and karma yoga liberates us. Karma binds us. So this is a very important thing that we have to keep it in mind. Karma yoga is the means, the way to reach our true identity, which is the immortal Atman. That is why throughout the Bhagavad Gita, we will see that Krishna again and again says, be yogis, be yogis, tasmad yogi bhavarjuna, Hey Arjun, become a yogi, become a yogi. Yogi means the person who is striving to go back to his true nature. That is the mean of a person who is yogi. Now, now the question comes, what is yoga? In this term karma yoga, we know what is karma. Karma means actions. Action is an inseparable part of human life. In fact, life itself means action. There is no life without action. Action defines life. When there is no action, life itself will come to, come to an end. Life means it's a stream of action. Now, as I said, action can either lead us to bondage, and if it is properly handled, handled it can take us to liberation. Now, this is the importance of understanding the need to handle the realm of action properly. That is what precisely Krishna teaches us in Bhagavad Gita. How to handle our day-to-day -day life which is full of action. How to handle it. Arjun was confused about it. And Krishna, the great master, he shows us the way. So how to act? Sri Krishna says, you act through yoga. And what do we mean by yoga? Sri Krishna, in the 48th verse of the second chapter, gives a beautiful definition of yoga. What is yoga? He says that, Yogastha Kuru Karmani, Sangam Tektva Dhananjaya, Sithya Siddhyo Samobhutva, Samatvam Yoga Uchate. This is a Beautiful definition of what yoga is. He says, what is yoga? Yoga is samatvam. The state of mind in which the person is fully equipoised. The equanimous state of mind. But this equanimous state of mind cannot come just like that. It comes from another factor which is very important. That is 
detachment, non-attachment. So Sangam Tyaktva, he says, Yogastha Kuru Karmani. Shri Krishna tells Arjuna, O oh Arjuna, you perform actions. But how? Sangam Tyaktva, without attachment or with detachment. Detachment for what? Siddhya Siddhyo Samo Bhutva. Without being concerned about Siddhi and Asiddhi. Without being anxious and worrying about the results of your actions, whether you are going to succeed or whether you are going to fail, what is going to be the outcome of your action without really worrying about that, through detachment, be equanimous and thus handle the situation of the work field. This is a beautiful definition which actually needs to be uh, looked into. We need to understand it in its uh, depth. So what does Krishna actually uh, say here? This state of yoga actually involves two things, as I said. First of all, it involves detachment, sangam tattva, or nissangatvam. This is a very crux of the whole of the Bhagavad Gita. If you look into this Bhagavad Gita, you will find almost more than half a dozen times Krishna uses this term. Action. How? Sangam Tyaktva. Sangam Tyaktva. Sangam Tyaktva. Without attachment. With detachment. With detachment. Act with detachment. This is a very important point in understanding our way, the way we handle the work situation. Because without detachment, we cannot have the state of mind in which we can remain equ equanimous. The equipoised state of mind is born out of detachment. Now just let us try to see the opposite of detachment, that is attachment. When we are attached to the results of what we are doing. We want the results to be of one kind and not of the other kind. When we are attached to the things outside with which we are dealing, when we are attached to, to, to certain situations, external situations, now what happens is the thing with which we are attached, that begins to govern us. Then the outcome of this attachment is not equanimity, but agitated state of mind, an excited state of mind, a disturbed state of mind, a state of mind where the person loses his composure. Now, so just see, we understand the equanimous state of mind if we compare it with the opposite of it, which is caused by attachment. When we are attached to the results of our action, it makes us anxious, it makes us worried, it makes us disturbed, it makes us biased. We become biased for one thing. We want one thing and we don't want to accept the opposite of that. This is the unequanimous state of mind with which usually we work. In this, what is happening is we lose our freedom in life. This is the biggest thing. Through detachment, what is actually happening, happening is we are reclaiming our freedom. Through attachment, we lose our freedom. Now the thing to which we are attached, it begins to govern us. We just become puppets in the hands of the things to which we are attached. So attachment is that cord, I would say. It's like, it's like a rope which ties us down to this fictional dimension of this world which we are experiencing and detachment is that wonderful state of mind through which we reclaim our lost freedom the one song of vedanta is freedom 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 do not lose your freedom as human beings we lose our freedom through attachment through which we become slaves to the developments that take place around us when we act in a certain way it produces results. These developments, if we are attached to them, 
they begin to govern us they begin to decide the state of our mind and they will leave us always agitated excited and without any equanimity and when there is no equanimity in the mind we will never be able to understand what is the true nature of our being that is why Shri Krishna says you act with an equanimous state of mind for which you have to be completely detached act Sangam Tektva such a wonderful thing it is so right in this verse in the 48th verse of Bhagavad Gita 48th verse of the second chapter Shri Krishna is showing us the way by which we can reclaim our lost freedom through attachment we become bound we become slaves and through detachment we reclaim our lost freedom and we begin to work like masters Shri Krishna is showing us the way to work like masters and not like slaves this is a great teaching which Krishna gives by defining what yoga is so yoga is what samatvam that equanimous state of mind which is brought about by detachment when we work in this manner remember we are moving from the fictional dimension of our personality to the real dimension of our personality this is what is karma yoga karma yoga helps us to travel from this apparent man to the real man and this is the very goal of the human life now we have just now referred to this point of detachment detachment is the central idea of Bhagavad Gita we can say it is also known as Anasakti Yoga Bhagavad Gita is also referred to as a book which teaches us how to be anasakta or to be detached or to be non-attached that is a central theme as I said this attachment is a thing which we need to handle it very seriously it is through attachment that we remain bound to this fictional dimension of existence and we never come face to face with reality and that is also the reason why we suffer throughout our life so it is detachment detachment is that sword detachment is also referred to as a sword in Bhagavad Gita Asanga Shastra Sri Krishna says in this uh, in this 15th chapter this detachment is referred to as Asanga Shastra through this Asanga Shastra Asanga means the sword the Shastra the weapon of detachment we can cut our bondage the way we have become bound to this fictional dimension of existence so but we need to understand a little bit of this detachment what do we mean by detachment actually many people when we talk about detachment or when they hear about detachment the first obvious uh, 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 idea that comes to the mind is not to be involved with anything not to engage oneself with anything to be unconcerned to our surrounding to be in, in one way we can say to be callous callousness callousness is uh, is, is, is it means uh, a kind of insensitivity to our surroundings is this detachment this person has not understood detachment at all detachment doesn't mean that we become unconcerned to our surrounding detachment doesn't mean that we are unsympathetic or insensitive to our surrounding detachment doesn't mean that you're not going to involve or engage with the stream of life this is not detachment at all if this is detachment then we can say that walls are the most detached entities existing in this world walls have no sensitivity they are not bothered about what is happening around them so we are not going to become like walls through detachment so this is not the right understanding of detachment Swami Vivekananda referring to this he says if we become like walls through the practice of detachment it is completely a quality of a brute it is like becoming a brute 
This is not detachment. This is not the detachment which Sri Krishna is talking about in Bhagavad Gita. Now, through detachment, does it mean that we are not going to involve with the stream of life? That we are not going to engage with the stream of life? No. Sri Krishna says, you have to fully engage yourself with the stream of life. You have to involve yourself with the stream of life. Now, second point is, does this involvement mean attachment? This is another point. In the name of detachment, we become unconcerned and we disengage ourselves with the mainstream of life. And in the name of involvement and engagement, we tend to become attached to what we are doing. These both the extremes are wrong. Sri Krishna says that person has understood detachment who fully engages in the stream of life, is fully drowned in all the activities, he is deeply concerned with everything, and yet being fully involved, he is fully detached. This is the true understanding of detachment. A person who has understood this very subtle way in which we have to handle our work situation, he has understood the spirit of Karma Yoga. To be deeply involved with everything in life and yet be unattached. So detachment or unattachment doesn't mean unconcern for what is happening around us. And involvement with activity doesn't mean that we have to become attached. A person who has understood these two things, he has understood the meaning of Karma Yoga. So Karma Yoga demands that you are fully involved into the thing which you are handling. It may be studies, it may be anything else, your involvement with the family, your involvement with the surrounding, your involvement with the country, your involvement with the humanity itself. You are deeply involved, but you are not attached. This is the subtle dimension of this point of Karma Yoga, which we need to understand properly. A person who has understood this to be deeply engaged and involved and yet absolutely unattached, he has understood the spirit of Karma Yoga. So, in the 11th verse of the 5th chapter, Sri Krishna says, Kayena manasa buddhya, kevalair indriyairapi, yogina karma kuruvanti. Yogina karma kuruvanti. The yogis, they do karma, they work. How? Kayena manasa buddhya. Kayena means with the body. Manasa means with the mind. And buddhya, buddhya means using the intellect. And indriyairapi, even through the sense organs. That means, Sri Krishna says, this karma yogi, he uses a psychophysical, this instrument, body, sense organs, mind, intellect. In short, he uses this grand instrument called the human body mind complex, and with that he is engaged in action. Kayena manasa buddhya kevalair indriyairapi yogina karma kurvanti. Yogis, they perform action, fully engaging their body, mind, sense organs, and buddhi into the action. But how? Sangam tektva. Kayena manasa buddhya kevalair indriyairapi yogina karma kurvanti. Sangam tektva. That is the secret. Complete engagement, full involvement, and yet at the same time, complete detachment. This is the secret of karma yoga. You engage yourself with the stream of life, fully into it. You are into your work. You are into your studies. You are into the affairs of the nation. You are into the affairs of the human race itself. But you hold yourself completely detached, unattached. This person has understood what karma yoga is. So Sri Krishna gives a beautiful illustration there. The illustration is, that illustration comes in the 10th verse of the 5th chapter, where Sri Krishna says, how to work, what is the illustration, how do we understand this state in which a person is fully involved and at the same time absolutely detached, untouched by his surroundings. So Krishna says, Brahmanyadhaya karmani, sangam tyakva karutiya, lipyate nasapapena, padma patra vibhambasa. 
beautiful illustration comes here. Krishna says, Brahmani Adhaya Karmani. As I said, see, now this person is doing his actions based upon the real nature of man, which is Brahman or Atman. When actions are performed, keeping that real nature of man in view, Brahmanyadhaya Karmani, Sangam Tektva Karutiya, and he is completely detached. He is detached to the fictional dimension. Lipyate Nasapapena, this person can never be caught up in anything of this fictional dimension, and he lives like Padma Patram, Eva Ambhasa, just like a lotus leaf floating on the surface of water. This is a beautiful illustration. Illustration of a lotus leaf. We all know how lotus leaf, it floats on the water. The water is uh, on the leaf. The droplets of water are on the leaf. But if you just shake the leaf, all the droplets just drop down. Water cannot stick to the leaf. Though the leaf is on the water, in the water, and yet water cannot stick to the leaf. A wonderful idea comes out of this imagery which Sri Krishna is uh, using here. Padma Patra Mibambasa. That is a lotus leaf on the surface of the water. What is the moral that we have to learn is that is to be non-sticking. Do not stick in, with anything in this life. You can be with everybody, just like the lotus leaf, which is on the surface of the water. It is inside the water, but the water cannot stick to it. Similarly, in our lives, we can be in all situations. We can be with our near and dear ones. We can be with our family members. We can be with our friends. We can be into everything, and yet we can remain absolutely non-sticking to our surroundings. So the philosophy of Bhagavad Gita is, in one word, I often uh, 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 coin it in this way, that is, sticking is strictly prohibited. Sticking is strictly prohibited. Be with everybody. Be with your near and dear ones. Be with your family members. Serve them. Do everything. Be deeply concerned about their welfare. But do not get stuck up to anything. Sticking is strictly prohibited. Just like the water drops cannot stick to the leaf, similarly we should not allow anything of this fictional dimension of reality to stick to our personality. This is a wonderful, in Hindi, I am saying that sometimes I say that when I am saying that, I say that in ये हमारे दीवारों के ऊपर हमें लिख के रख देना चाहिए क्या है फिलॉसफी भगवत गीता का जो मूल जो फिलॉसफी है वो क्या है चिपकना मना है आप सब के साथ रहिए अपने घर वालों के साथ रहिए सभी अपने दोस्तों के साथ रहिए सभी की मंगल कामना कीजिए सभी की सेवा कीजिए अपने अपना जो भी कर्तव्य है उसको निभाइए लेकिन चिपकना मना है वी शुड write it on the walls of our rooms sticking is strictly prohibited this is the karma yogi's way of living he lives for the good of everybody he is deeply concerned with the welfare of everybody but he sticks nowhere just like padma patra mipambhasa a person who lives in this way he is a truly a karma yogi now there are another certain points you know which which are related to this idea of attachment. With the idea of attachment comes, attachment means what? Sangam. With the idea of asakti or sangam comes mamatva. This mamatva is another dangerous thing. So when we are attached to some persons, when we have a kind of attachment to certain things, certain situations, out of this attachment is born. A sense of mindness, mamatva. When you are attached to a person, then you begin to as if possess that person. The sense of possessiveness which proceeds from attachment. Attachment is the mother which gives birth to this child called possessiveness, mamatva. This is mine. 
first you get attached to a thing, attached to a person, then you say, this is mine. This is how we become bound to things and persons and situations. And with this, another, there is one point, that is selfishness. But this kind of possessiveness and attachment to the things is what ultimately it all boils down to the, the great disease of selfishness. Then you begin to do everything for one's own fictional identity, not one's own real identity. So these three factors, attachment, possessiveness, and selfishness, that is sangam, mamatvam, and swartha, all these things are actually the mother of all the evils that we have in our life. That's why Krishna says, be detached, be unattached, and be nirmama. So many times in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna uses this word, nisangatvam and nirmamatvam, nisangatvam and nirmamatvam. Be detached and do not have the sense of possessiveness about anything in this fictional dimension of existence. Nirmamatvam, nisangatvam and niswarthata. Once again, I repeat, nirmamatvam, nisangatvam and niswarthata. These are the characteristics which actually define a karma yogi. He is detached. He has got no sense of possessiveness for anything of this fictional dimension of existence. And he is unselfish. These are the characteristics, the traits of a karma yogi. So as the students of this karma yoga, we should first remember to just sum up this whole discussion. The philosophy is chipakna manahe. Sticking is strictly prohibited. You be with everybody, serve everybody, but do not stick to anything. Ladies can understand this better. Just like in kitchen, we have the non-stick pans. You put anything into that non-stick pan, nothing sticks to it. So we have to be like that, absolutely non-sticking. We are inside this fictional dimension of existence, yet we don't allow anything to stick to us. This is the secret of Karma Yoga. You are intensely active, intensely engaging yourself with this stream of life. You are involved with everything, but you are completely detached, just like the lotus leaf on the surface of the water. What a wonderful thing it is. Now, another one thing which is implied in this whole thing till now what we have discussed is, that is, if we just see, what is Krishna teaching us in this? Karma Yoga. He is asking us to be fully engaged and involved with whatever we are doing at a particular point of time. What, is, what actually it implies is, he says that, pay full attention to the means. Don't worry about the ends. Our job is to only pay attention to the means, the work at in our hand, be engaged with that work, with your whole soul. But don't worry about the end, the results. What is going to be the results? The results will come on its own if you have paid full attention to the means in your hand. This is very, very important, not only for students, for everybody. Everybody in every field of action, whatever we are doing, we should do it in such a way that we pour our whole soul into that particular activity without worrying about what is going to be the outcome of that particular act. What a wonderful thing it is. This is what Sri Krishna says in the 47th verse of the second chapter. The famous verse, which everybody, all of you might have heard it. It is being quoted everywhere through ages and it will be quoted for ages to come. It is the biggest secret while handling the work situation, the way to handle it, here lies the secret. Sri Krishna says, Karmanyeva adhikaraste, ma phaleshu kadachada, ma karma phala heturbhu, ma te sangostva karmani. What a beautiful thing it is. Krishna says, Karmanyeva adhikaraste, te adhikara karmanyeva. You have right only to work. Pay full attention to the work in your hand. 
you have no right to think about what is going to be the outcome of that activity. So pay attention to the means, the ends will take care of itself. This is a wonderful thing. Usually in life what happens is, we often engage ourselves or we often drown ourselves thinking about what is going to be the outcome. We are worried about the result right in the beginning even when we have not engaged ourselves with work. work. This is the big mistake that we commit in our everyday life. Instead of paying attention to the work, we are worried about what is going to be the outcome right in the beginning, even before we have started our work. That is how we don't get the right kind of result which we want. Of course, it is another matter. A karma yogi will never be bothered about the results. That is another matter. But just for the sake of our understanding, I, am, I want to make this point very clear that when we work, the secret is we put our whole soul into what we are doing without bothering about what is going to, be, going to be the outcome of this action. This is what Sri Krishna says, Karmani eva adhikaraste ma phaleshu kadachita. You have no right to think about what is going to be the result. Now, this is how one has to work. That means you drown yourself into the work which you are doing with your body, with your mind, with your sensory system, with your buddhi and everything. And at the same time, be absolutely detached do not worry about what is going to be the outcome of this action in this way, which when we work without any attachment, without any selfishness, without any mamatvam or a sense of possessiveness about the things which we are handling, when we work in this way, we are actually working in a way which will bring about an equanimous state of mind, that is yoga. Our mind will remain equanimous equipoised, it will not be disturbed and it is in this undisturbed state of mind when the mind is completely balanced it doesn't lose its balance it is not anxious it is not worried about what is going to be the outcome of the action which one is doing when we have this kind of an equanimity within ourselves it is in this equanimous state of mind that we will be moving towards the real nature of our being which is the Atman. This is how Karma Yoga, through handling the work situation very wisely, in a very wonderful manner, prepares us to experience our true dimension, which is the Atman. That is why Shankaracharya says, Karma Yoga, Yoga is Tat Prapti Upaya. It is the Upaya, it is the means by which we realize our true nature. There is no other meaning to the word Karma Yoga. Through karma yoga, a karma yogi is not worried about what he is going to get from the fictional dimension of this existence. Let us make this point very clear. A karma yogi is unconcerned about the benefits or the so-called good things that he is going to derive from the fictional dimension of existence because he knows after all it is fictional dimension. This is not real. This is transitory, this is temperament. So he is not worried about that. Yes, as a result of his wholehearted engagement with the work, he may get some benefits, but that is actually just like a byproduct. As a byproduct, he may get certain good things of life, but he is not concerned about it. His main attention is to move away from the fictional dimension and reach his true nature. This is what Karma Yoga accomplishes through the development of the equanimous state of mind, which is brought about by detachment, non-possessiveness, and unselfishness. Three points. When we are detached, when we don't have a sense of possessiveness about what we are engaging with, and when we are acting selflessly, when we have these three things, our mind will be in a state of equanimity. This is yoga, samatvam yoga uchyate, this equanimous state of mind is yoga and when we have this kind of an equanimous state of mind, automatically we will begin to experience the true nature of our personality. This is the intention of Sri Krishna, how he takes us, helps us to move from the so-called the apparent man to the real man. So Sri Krishna says that this is the skillfulness in action. In verse 50 
of the second chapter, Sri Krishna says, Buddhi yukto jahati ha ubhe sukrita dushkrite tasmat yogaya yujjasva yoga karma sukaushalam. Beautiful verse. He says, Buddhi yukta. This Buddhi yukto jahati ha, the person who is equipped with this kind of a state of mind, completely equanimous, having no attachment having no sense of mamatvam or possessiveness to the things of the world, and he is completely unselfish. This person who is working with this equanimous state of mind, that person, this is the skillfulness in action. So see, we all have different skills. Somebody can be, somebody may be very good in a certain area. We have IT specialists, we have doctors, we have engineers, engineers, they are skilled in certain areas of life. This is one kind of skill. We can say that this is a skill on the external front, the outside front. But there is something called internal skill. That internal skill, the real skill, fullness in the field of action is yoga. A person who is working with this yoga or with his samatva buddhi, he is actually skillful in action. Minus this yoga factor, that person may be externally skillful. He may be a good IT professional. He may be a good doctor. But minus this yoga factor, Krishna says he is not actually skillful in action. The true meaning of being skillful in the field of activity is the state of equanimity, which is born out of non-attachment, unselfishness, and non-possessiveness. Nirmamatvam, nisangatvam and niswartata which results into that samatva buddhi which becomes a way for us to reach our true nature so in this way Sri Krishna says yoga karma sukaushalam the skillfulness in action is actually nothing but yoga now when a person works in this manner Krishna says in the 12th verse of the 5th chapter yukta karma phalam tyaktva shanti maapnotim naishthikim a beautiful verse Krishna says yukta karma phalam tyaktva this kind of a karma yogi who is not worried about karma phalam he is not worried about what is going to be the outcome of his actions in this fictional dimension of existence in this way when he works without attachment without a sense of possessiveness and without selfishness, what happens? He attains Naishtikim Shantim. He attains that supreme peace. What a wonderful thing it is. Just see, are we not all really hankering for peace of mind? Let us remember one point. Now, all that we have discussed in now, these great qualities of detachment, non-possessiveness, and niswarthata, unselfishness. Just look into the opposite of that. Attachment. You are attached to this person, that person. You are attached to the results of your own actions. You want your results to be of one kind. You don't want it to be of the other kind. You are biased. You are biased while handling human beings because, you're, because of your attachment. And you have a sense of possessiveness when you deal with those persons, when you, do, when you deal with those results of your actions. You have a sense of possessiveness. And you do this all for the selfishness, with a selfish attitude. To, and the selfish attitude means you are actually further fattening your false identity or the fictional identity. Now this kind of a frame of mind, in which the person is attached, he is possessive of things around us, around himself, and is selfish. This person is constantly living a slavish life. He is being governed by his surroundings. He is slaves. He is a slave to his surroundings through his attachment and through his sense of possessiveness. This person can never understand what is peace of mind. So, what every human being is actually looking for is the peace of mind. And this peace of mind can come only by developing these great virtues of Nisangatvam, 
nirmamatvam and niswartata which results in this development of the equanimous state of mind which brings about supreme peace so shri krishna says yuktaha karma phalam tyaktva having completely given up his attachment for karma phalam for the results of his actions shanti maapnotim naishthikim he attains the supreme shanti peace and when the mind is peaceful it is in this peaceful state of mind that he comes face to face with the real nature of his own personality which is the atman so in this way we can see that this karma yoga is a great method by which shri krishna shows us the way from our fictional identity and fictional personality to the real identity and the real personality which is a wonderful thing to just uh, uh, sum up the whole thing whatever we have to right in the beginning i spoke about the two dimensions one is the apparent man and other is the real man without referring to this real man or the real uh, nature of the man without referring to it karma yoga cannot be discussed karma yoga is the way the means through which we discover our true nature so a karma yogi is never bothered about what he is going to get from this so called the fictional dimension of existence this dimension is continuously changing it is temporary it is transient it is destructive the real dimension is within each one of us that is yet to be discovered that is indestructible that is eternal that is unchanging that is blissful all the best things of life which we are actually looking for it lies in the non physical dimension of the human personality so this karma yoga is the method by which we handle our work situation in such a way that we move from the fictional identity and fictional dimension of this existence to that real dimension that is karma yoga and to do that shri krishna says we have to be equanimous and this equanimity of the human mind is brought about by detachment unselfishness and non possessiveness about the things which we are handling and when we develop these qualities in and through that automatically we attain supreme peace through which we realize our true nature and one very important point detachment doesn't mean that we become unconcerned to our surrounding let me remember remind this point again it's a very important point detachment doesn't mean that we become unsympathetic insensitive or unconcerned or uninvolved with the activities of life that is not detachment at all and to be involved with the activities of the life doesn't mean that we have to become attached the secret of karma yoga is to be deeply involved with the stream of life and action and yet remain unattached just like the lotus leaf which floats on the water what a beautiful imagery shri krishna gives that is padma patram eva ambhasa so the philosophy is sticking is strictly prohibited chipakna mana hai be with everybody be with your profession be with your relatives be with your friends be with the world engage yourself with it for the good of others not for good for the selfish ends only worrying about the good of others but by being completely detached this is the beautiful balance that we have to discover in and through our action itself we have to act and constantly monitor whether we are getting attached or not if we can act without attachment without selfishness we are slowly becoming karma yogis and that will result in the great attainment of our own self so the bottom line of shri krishna's message is do not stick to anything chipakna mana hai be like the lotus leaf which is floating on the surface of the water padma patram eva ambasa thank you so the first question here is uh, that generally we have a habit of being attached so please suggest some practice that we can implement in daily life 
change his habit and develop attachment. Yes. Now it is very easy to talk about detachment and non-attachment. But it is a lifetime work. <clears throat> now here we have to uh, bring in certain other virtues into our life to succeed in the practice of non-attachment or detachment. Remember one thing. The biggest instrument which human beings have, but which is not utilized or which lies dormant and suspended. That instrument is the instrument of Vivek, discrimination. Let me just explain this point. Without discrimination, you cannot have detachment. Detachment is the outcome of a higher understanding about what is real and what is unreal. Unless we have this, a higher view of life, a deeper view of life, a more profound insight into the facts of life, we need to investigate into our own self and find out in this so-called I, which, which I am experiencing, what is the reality? Where is the reality? Is the body real? Is the mind real? Are the sense organs real? Is the world which I am experiencing outside, is it really absolutely existing? These are the questions. Now, this is the process of awakening the faculty of Viveka. Viveka is that faculty through which one investigates into what is unchanging and what is changing. What is real and what is unreal. Once we engage in this process of making this discrimination between the unchanging and the changing, and when we get a deeper insight, and when we come to some very solid conclusions through this process of inquiry, what will be the conclusion? We will see that everything that we are experiencing at this physical plane, through our sense organs, and so this body and the mind, everything is transient, Everything is temporary. Everything is pratikshanam anyatha subhava. Everything is changing every moment. This is something very questionable. Can we say that this is actually existing? Now the question, we slowly in and through this inquiry, then we enter into the deeper waters of truth. It's a bold inquiry. So what is needed is this awakening of this faculty of viveka. When you understand that whatever we are experiencing, it cannot be true, automatically the outcome of this conclusion, this conviction, it is not mere conclusion, it is a conviction, conclusion, you can conclude intellectually and yet you reach nowhere. It's not merely a conclusion, a conclusion further maturing into a deep conviction. Yes, this is fictional, this is transient, this is temporary. And it is the mother of all evils, suffering and misery in life. Automatically, you develop detachment to this fictional dimension of existence. So this is how in our day-to-day -day life, by awakening this faculty of Viveka, which is translated as discrimination. I would say more than discrimination, it is a discernment. You discern what is what. You discern what is real and what is unreal. A clarity comes to the human understanding. It is a struggle, a striving to bring some clarity to the human man, human mind. And when this clarity comes, when you begin to understand what is real and what is appearing to be real, obviously, as a consequence, you will begin to turn away from that which is unreal and that which is transient. You will develop that wonderful virtue of detachment. This is the way how we have to uh, develop this detachment in and through the awakening of this great faculty of Viveka. Thank you, Swamiji. The next question is, uh, it's more like a series of questions. So in order to avoid detachment, is it necessary to renounce expectations from others, such as honor and fame? And if so, then uh, what, are our, what should be our motivations behind uh, more intense actions in everyday lives? Yes. 
See, we are talking about karma yogis. Okay, make this point very clear. We are not talking about people who are happy with this fictional dimension of existence. Those who are happy with the fictional dimension of the existence, they would be running after name and fame, honor and all these things. So we are not talking about those people. So first, let us make clear what do we want in life. If this is the question, the questioner should first ask himself or herself what he or she really wants. Is, does she want something from the fictional dimension of existence? Then that is no more Karma Yoga. As I said, Karma Yoga cannot be discussed unless you bring the dimension of reality into picture. What is real? It is only in the context of reality, what is actually really existing. You may call it reality, you may call it Atman, you may call it God, Bhagwan, whatever it is. These are all the different terms. There is a dimension of existence which is absolutely existing, which is not known to most of us. The struggle of the human life is to come in touch with that through experience. So a Karma Yogi is a person who is not motivated by anything else. What is this motivation you are asking? His only motivation to be detached is to come face to face with this unchanging dimension of his personality. There is no other motivation for him to act in a detached manner. Secondly, he knows that attachment is the mother of all evil and sufferings in life. This honor and fame which we are running after, this is all for two minutes and two days, then it is gone. If you get elated with honor, you are going to get depressed when you have dishonor. So be ready to face both the things. This is what happens in life. The Karma Yogi very clearly says, honor and dishonor, success and failure, all these polarities in life, favorable, unfavorable, all these things, pleasure and pain. If these are the things which you are actually looking for, you are looking for only pleasure, you don't want pain. You are looking for only honor, you don't want dishonor, you don't want to be humiliated. You want only success, you don't want to face failure. This is a person who is not going to be a karma yogi. For a karma yogi, he takes both these things in the same stride. He has got a same understanding about honor as well as dishonor. These two things are the same, two sides of the same coin. So his motivation to be detached is that he wants to move away from the so-called temporary, transient, fictional dimension of existence to the real dimension where lies the true joy and bliss, the freedom. Here we are completely bound. You see, you are bound by your thirst for honor. We become bound by our thirst for success, only success. We don't want to face failure. When failure comes, we become depressed. When success comes, we become elated, out of control. This we see in life. This is how we are tossed up and down in the stream of life by success and failure, by honor and dishonor, and all these so-called polarities of experiences. So a Karma Yogi's true motivation is nothing else. He is detached because he wants to move towards the real dimension of his personality. And he knows this attachment is a mother of all the evils, all the suffering and misery in human life. The next question is, uh, does adapting to a new environment or a new culture imply a loss of our true nature? The true nature is never lost. No matter to which culture you adapt or you adopt, new surroundings which you adapt or adopt, this has got nothing to do with the true nature. The true nature is unchanging. This is all what we are talking about. That is a new surrounding or new culture. All these things are belonging to the so-called, the fictional or the transient dimension of existence. Behind all these things is the true dimension, which is unchanging. So that never changes. Next is, could you explain uh, how to know if a person is fully detached? Yeah. If a person is fully detached, nothing under the sun can make him agitated. Nothing under the sun can 
derail him from his true path. He is perfectly balanced in all the situations of life, whether he meets with successes in life or whether he meets failures in life, whether people honor him or whether people ignore him, whether he gets things which are favorable to him, whether he gets things which are totally unfavorable to him, whether he experiences pain or whether he experiences joy in life, he is absolutely equanimous in all these situations with, by, while handling all these polarities of experiences. These are the hallmarks of a person who is completely detached. Just I uh, once again let me bring back that imagery of Bhagavad Gita. He is just like a lotus leaf which is floating on the water. This waters, the droplets of water, they are like you know the different kinds of experiences. Some droplets you can say the droplets of success and droplets of failure, droplets of pain and droplets of pleasure, droplets of honor and droplets of dishonor. None of these things can stick to him. You just give it one push and all these droplets just fall down. He's totally non-stick to all these things. This is what I said. The philosophy is chipatna manahe. Sticking is strictly prohibited. So this person is totally non-sticking to whatever happens uh, in his surroundings. All the developments which is happening around him, he is absolutely non-sticking to it. Good, bad, he takes it in same stride. This is the characteristic of a person who is detached. The next question here is, are duty and karma the same? Yes, duty, duty is a part of karma. Duty is very important. Duty is a good motivation through which we get connected with people around us. But duty is a good motive only at a certain level. Duty is a, a very important component of karma, action, activity, because everybody has got a duty to work. All of you as a student, you have a duty. So you can work with a sense of duty. Children have their duty towards their parents. Parents have their duty towards children. Everybody is duty bound. And this duty expresses in the form of actions of a particular kind. It is a good motive. When we are duty bound, it gives a direction to our actions. It makes us dedicated to certain things in a certain way. We are committed by duty. It's a good thing. But there is a higher motive through which we can perform those very actions, not with a sense of duty, but with a higher motive. That is something wonderful. What is that motive? That is what actually, if we begin, to, for example, let us take an example. Children are duty bound to respect their parents. No one can not only respect their parents, to serve their parents, to look after their parents. So in this, in, when we work with a sense of duty, it may not give us a joy. We may, we, may, we may be taking care of our parents just because it is my duty. It may not be giving me that joy out of it. We are doing it just for the sake of doing it because I am related to that other person as a son. The other person is my father or a mother. And as a duty, I do something. This is one way of action motivated by the sense of duty. Other ways, higher ways, not by duty. I am not duty bound. The karma yoga is not duty. Karma yogi is not duty bound. The karma yogi also looks after the father or the mother, not through the sense of duty. He sees a higher thing. He sees the same divinity residing in them. He sees God residing in them. And with that idea, he looks after them. And in his act of looking after them, he is actually worshipping God. He is worshipping that higher reality. You see, his motivation is now different. It is not duty as such. So duty is a good thing at a lower realm. But to be duty bound throughout the life, it is a horrible thing. We are not remain, 
We are not born to be duty bound throughout our life. We have to rise above it. We should learn to work and act not with a sense of duty, but with the motivation that everything is divine and you are serving everything. And in and through your service, you are actually worshipping the divine. This is the higher way of negotiating this field of activity. What a wonderful thing it is. This we take activity to a totally different level. So duty is a very important component of the field of activity. It is very good at a lower plane, but we have to rise. We have to learn. A karma yogi is not merely working with a sense of duty. A true karma yogi will raise his motivation to higher levels and he will be working not with the sense of a compulsion. In duty, there is a sense of compulsion. No, karma yogi doesn't work with a sense of compulsion. No compulsion. He works spontaneously because he sees divinity everywhere. He sees God everywhere. He sees the same Atman everywhere and his action in and through his action he is actually worshipping that reality. So to be duty bound is good in the beginning but actually speaking we have to raise our uh, uh, motivation higher and learn to work not out of compulsion but out of a spontaneous outpouring of the heart which takes the form of worship. That is the wonderful way in which Karma Yogi works. Thank you, Swamiji. Uh, our last question for today, shall we? Uh, considering all kinds of attacks happening on our country and culture at the moment, what is the responsibility of the youth? What is the responsibility of the youth? Youth. Yes. Uh, uh, should I repeat it in case it was not out of order? Yes, please, please repeat the question. All right. So the question is, uh, considering all kinds of attacks occurring on our country and culture right now, what should be the responsibility of the youth? Yeah, it's a wonderful question. Wonderful question. The youth should be deeply concerned about this matter. Deeply involved with this issue. The youth should engage himself or herself to tackle this problem. This is the foremost duty of every young man and woman, every boy and girl of this country, our culture, our dharma. Let us remember, this is the land of dharma, Vaidika Sanatana Dharma. And to protect this dharma, let us start with a sense of duty. It is the duty of every citizen of this country to protect the root civilization of this country. If this dharma exists, India will exist. If this dharma is destroyed, India is bound to be destroyed. There will be no more Bharat. Bharat is existing because of the Vaidika Sanatana Dharma. Let us make this point very clear. So let us negotiate this problem with a sense of duty. As I said, you can negotiate this problem either with a sense of duty, very well, or you can handle this from the higher motivation as well. That in and through protecting this Dharma and this Rashtra, you are worshipping God. So see, the same thing, the engagement with this issue can be done at several levels. But whatever it is, the youth have to engage themselves with this issue. They can do it either from the lower motivations of a sense of duty or they may do it as an act of worship. The best way of worshipping Ishwara is to protect this dharma, dharma rakshanartham. This is very important. Every boy and girl of this country have to dedicate, dedicate their lives for the protection of this great civilization, the Vedic civilization, which alone actually goes into the defining of what Bharat is. I am very thankful whoever has asked this question. I sincerely thank that uh, boy or girl who has raised this issue. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for your time and time and wise words, Swamiji. So uh, here we shall conclude our last talk or Gita Mahatma. Thank you. Thank you so much. Once again, I thank the organizers for having given me a chance to be a part of this program and I could share my ideas on this very important subject of Karma Yoga. Thank you so much. Om Tat Sat.